everyone wants to start the new year right. New goals, new energy, new focus, ready for anything with a clean slate. New year, new me, right? Well, kinda, but not really. On this podcast, I've made mention that everything builds off itself, or everything is linked to the here and now as far as training goes. Physically, all the training days, race days, rest days have brought you into the fitness form and fatigue that you have today. Mentally, we build on all of these experiences together to form our knowledge base on how to train, race, and rest into the now. The new year provides a pivot point for us to simply start a new chapter in the same book that we are writing. To write it well, you don't throw out the previous to just simply charge forward. No, you keep with the same storylines and build on what you have done. I guess that is to say if what you already have done is is somewhat good. But my point here is to spend more time reflecting on 2022 before burning it in the dumpster because of one bad race or a bad experience that you had and then sign up for more races and more things in 2023. Why? What's past is prologue, right? So we should study the past to plan for a better future. In other words, before planning out your annual training plan and before stressing out about how long to spend in base one versus base two or tempo versus sweet spot, did you simply reflect on your plan and execution from the past year? Did you ask the right questions? Did you learn anything from the successes and the failures? Did you inquire about what you could do differently next time? Today, I'll provide a simple framework for how to effectively reflect on the past season, which will provide a more descriptive insight so you can plan better for the coming year. I've got two great coaches to help us learn how to do this today, as well as learn from how they build athletes for success. But before we get into it, you may be listening to this just a bit after the new year. Don't worry. The stuff we go over today will still help you in your planning process for the upcoming season. So you haven't missed the boat on anything. If you're listening to this mid-season or really at any point in your life, I think you'll find that the framework and ideas that we discuss here can always be applied to your training and racing because the process of good training and coaching are evergreen. A continual cycle of planning, executing, evaluating, improving, and then executing again for a better result. Intellectually, I think you know that. But emotionally, I want you to let it seep in this year. Spend more time reflecting, be slower to set big goals, challenge yourself to be a better athlete in the new year. All this today on the Train Right Podcast. Welcome back or welcome to the Train Right Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Adam Pulford. As promised, I have two wonderful coaches as guests with me today, Matthew Boucher, Darcy Murphy. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Adam. Good to be here. Before we get going, I, I know you both very well. I mean, we, we've been uh, working, coaching, uh, supporting each other out at the Tour of the Gila, Matthew, for, um, I don't even know what year that was, but 10 plus years. And Darcy, I think you've been with CTS longer than I have, but for our audience who don't know as much about you. Uh, Could you tell us more about who you are? And I'll just start with Darcy. Hey, for sure. Uh, I've been with CTS for almost 20 years, which is hard to believe. Uh, I started coaching predominantly cyclists. I was kind of a a road racer, a little bit of mountain bike racing myself. Um, And then maybe six or seven years ago, I switched over not completely. I still coach cyclists, um, but I'm also working with a lot of ultra runners and multi-sport athletes. So a little skiing in there. Um, I kind of like to do it all. So it's really fun to, to work with athletes that have a little ADHD also. So perfect. Perfect. And, and Matthew, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, let's see. Son, husband, father of three. Uh, that's about it. No, uh, do um you have you I have you're the husband of three wives? Is that, is that uh right? did I say husband, husband of father? Three father of three, didn't I say? Okay. I think. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> whatever it is. They make me crazy. Um but in my side time I uh I do do coaching um in the background 
from the endurance side was uh, growing up as a runner and then turning cyclist through injury um, and being fortunate enough to race professionally for seven years. Uh, I got to travel the world doing that. Um, and uh, through that and my educational background landed here at CTS. And uh, now I'm trying to help people uh, maximize their fun and their return for their time um, and primarily doing cyclists. And as you can tell to, to our audience, it, you know, we have a, a good spectrum kind of of experience here with the coaches. I mean, they both have been coaching and competing for a very long time. As you can hear, uh, Matthew spent a lot of time on the elite uh, athlete side of things. Darcy raced at high level and can basically do it all. So I think when we, when I combine the forces here uh, of all the knowledge and bandwidth, I think we're, I think we're queuing up for a really good show. So in my intro, I talked about how a lot of athletes are really eager to get going for 2023. Uh, a lot of motivation, real quick question to you both. I mean, is that what you're seeing from your athletes right now? I think early winter really starts stoking the fire. You're seeing like races open up, lotteries are happening. That's also natural that we should um, be seeing our athletes get really excited for the season ahead. Um, I would say the excitement and the signing up for the race is the easy part, right? I've been victim to that myself. I just get back from a great day of skiing and I'm ready for my first hundred miler. I don't know how those two are connected, but there's something about, you know, like being really hyped for the season ahead. Um, and I think that you should really embrace that and use that uh, and be realistic uh, at the same time, like starting to plot, like yeah. what does it look like to um, start to design your preparation? Totally. Matthew, how about, how about you? I'd say I have all sides of the spectrum. I got young, eager people who are probably doing too much too early. Um, and I've got, uh, uh, even, uh, you know, master's level racers who just did a big, you know, season pushing all sorts of different events from long range events to crits. And then, uh, then it's Zwift season, you know, now they want a Zwift race and you're like, okay, well now we, you know, when are we like going to relax a little bit? So, um, it's always, yeah, it's always a challenge to, uh, to find that balance for them. But, um, yeah, I think the holidays is just kind of a welcome interruption sometimes. And it's good, uh, good for people to sort of be forced to take that break. So, yeah, I mean, if it's, uh, it's the whole, whole run of run of the show, uh, for, for all my people from yeah excitement to, uh, dragging their feet as winter actually really kicks in for, people who are, um, you know, in the, in the colder climates and they've been forced from some outdoor riding to now being forced indoors and take some few weeks to get motivated to do that. Yeah. I I'm seeing that too. I mean, I think it's, it's pretty natural. Like, like Darcy said, uh, you know, that November time period, people are getting real stoked about that. The holidays, yeah, it's that, that little pivot hinge point, but a lot of motivation, a lot of stoke to get going into the new year. But, you know, in my intro as well, I talked about how, you know, the industry as well as the athlete and the industry kind of pushes this because they want to capital, they want people to sign up. The lotteries are open, like Darcy said, in that holiday kind of like spending mode and like planning mode for mm -hmm. next year. You know, they want to capitalize on that. And it's super easy just to jam into signing up for all the things, planning for all the things without taking too much time to reflect. And today what I want to do is, is spend some time in reflection and using some examples, some real world examples from your athletes of kind of, um, and, and then using that framework that I talked about to, to help in that reflection process so that the athlete, uh, the listener here can do it better for the next year. So if there's anything that you do take away from this episode, it's just like, Hey, pump the brakes a little bit, chill out, reflect, then go. Darcy, I'll, ladies first, I'll give you the first question from an arbitrary standpoint. Um, but what were some of the big races or events that your athletes did in 2022? Like just give us a few examples and then we'll go deep into one of them perhaps. 
Sure. Uh, I had a couple of athletes do the steamboat gravel event. That was the first time I've coached athletes for that specific event. Um, I had a, a lady race over at UTMB. She did TDS. It's a 145 kilometer race. One of the arguably the hardest race, uh, at UTMB. She did great top 20 finish. Um, and then I had a couple of athletes. I coached for 200 milers. This was my first year coaching for that distance. And I was, I was pretty intimidated to be honest. Um, it's not just doubling what you would do for a hundred mile, uh, race, you know, body can't really handle that. So, uh, it was a good challenge. Um, ended up successful on both accounts. Um, and I can talk a little bit more, um, about one athlete in particular that did Cocodona 250. That was kind of a, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, just a really, uh, good story, uh, great outcome, uh, not conventional. So kind of it in a nutshell. Are these time crutched athletes fitting in training for 200 miles? One of them. Yes. One of them is a, a master athlete who's retired. Um, but the one was, that's impressive. Uh, in his early, yeah, that's amazing. yeah, definitely. And it's in his running races that we're talking about, right? Yep. 250, mm -hmm. 200, uh, foot, yeah. foot races. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, crazy. Okay, yeah, we'll 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 double click on one of those examples here in a, in a second. Um, Matthew, what kind of flavor of races and events did your athletes have going for twenty twenty two? Yeah, again, it was it was full spectrum. Um, you know, on the on the short end, I had some people racing for you know national events, um, you know, national championships, things like that. But probably the the biggest piece of pie went to uh, one of my athletes who uh, in, I think it was early July or late July, he retired from being an anesthesiologist uh, and promptly uh, left to ride across the U.S. So uh, in the midst of working like a, what he called part-time, but it was still, I think, 40 hours a week of, of work. Um, he trained and then managed to very successfully ride across the U S. Uh, so wow. he did it with, uh, with truck travel. Uh, so it was, it was well supported, which I'm sure helped, but still a, still a big, uh, big endurance challenge. Yeah, for sure. How many days did that take him? I think it was 40 to 50, if I'm not mistaken, it was wow. Portland, yeah. Oregon to Portland, Maine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So kind of from both of you, some, I mean, kind of all the spectrums, but some of those big ones are really some ultra type endurance stuff. That's cool. That's super cool. Um, Darcy, I'll, I'll go back to you and kind of stay focused on, um, your athlete and kind of your process for the next four questions here, but, and then I'll swing over to Matthew and ask him the similar questions. So first, what were some of the things that you and your athlete did really well to prepare for that big race? managed the time and energy that he had available. Uh, so he owns his own business and then his fiance, um, is a wedding planner. So on the weekends, most often they would have one to two wedding events all evening. Um, so he didn't have a lot of time to train. Granted, he was a really talented athlete. So he ran in college, has that background, um, had done maybe one, hundred miler or a 100 K so new ish to the ultra running scene. Right. So here's the picture, um, guy running his own business. And then on the weekends working from let's say one in the afternoon until midnight on his feet. Okay. So am I going to send him out for seven to eight hours Saturday and Sunday once in a while? Not very often. Right. Um, so his average, training weekly time all said and done for the like I want to say four months leading up to Cocodona 250 was 10 hours that's like for a hundred mile race um I was nervous <laughs> I was like I don't know if if he's going to be able to get through this right he right. not only that's got pretty through low it, training time for such a huge, exactly. huge race for sure we, yeah. we had him on the bike a little bit dealing with some lower leg injuries so we did integrate a little bit of cycling which I think helped but um he ended up placing 16th overall. Um, 
really smoked it. 80, 87 hours um, of just moving. In hindsight, uh, the weddings, being on his feet after running three, four, five hours, that was part of his training, ultimately, right? Yeah. You, you get done ran, running and then yeah. you're on your feet needing to be cognizant, uh, aware of what's going on, get up the next day, do it again. <clears throat> so his lifestyle, mm -hmm. uh, rather than inhibiting his training, I think ultimately added to his success. So managed time well, made good use of the the hours spent training. That's something that you guys did well. What did you what did you not do so well in that preparation? I think we had him race a little too frequently. He did a hundred K and a hundred miler in the two months leading up to that. Did great at both of them, but the recovery from the hundred miler, um, I think took a little bit more than he gained from racing that hundred miler. So it's really tricky to, mm -hmm. to set that timing and, and know if your athlete is going to benefit from racing uh, a B race, a, mm -hmm. a training race for the A event or not. And sometimes you won't know right. until you get through it all. Um, but if, if we had to do it over again, it would probably be dropping uh, the hundred miler that we used in preparation for it. And what is the top one or, or what are the top two things that you learned in prepping that athlete for that big race? Less is more. You want to give them uh, every single minute that you can, right? Like over schedule them, uh, make sure they're prepared. Um, but we managed his injuries well, focused on quality. A lot of weeks there was one interval workout per week, which science says that's arguably not enough to get the adaptations you're going for. Um, right. but in the end yeah. he had a really successful race. So I think we, less was more in this case. And less, less training time, less intensity, both of those less yep. define both of those. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Less training time okay. than you typically would for a 200 miler. And, you know, generally I would give an athlete two, maybe three interval workouts per week for this athlete. It was one, maybe two interval workouts per week. Okay. And final question, uh, what would you have done differently now knowing what you know now? Um, in addition to probably dropping the hundred miler, uh, assure him we were doing enough. Like he told me <laughs> after the fact that, uh, he had a buddy that was prepping for the same race training, uh, alongside him oftentimes asking him, why are you training so little? This athlete, I think dropped at mile 60, went out really hot and, and was done. Um, so, you know, plenty yeah. of people were questioning him. Are you doing enough? Are you going to be ready for this? Um, and I think I didn't really know that at the time he told me this after the fact, but yeah, with a crystal ball, I would have said, Hey, you're, you're doing enough between what you're doing, uh, in your work life and training. You're prepared for this. It's so hard to know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's coaching. <laughs> exactly. yeah, that, that is coaching. And, but I would say I get that quite often. If I'm, if I'm coaching some athletes on a team or uh, just their peers, something like that, especially juniors, yeah. it's, it's like, I'll get the, the question from the athlete. I'll get the call from the parents be like, you know, they're the, uh, the teammates doing like 18 hour weeks and she's only doing 15. Are we sure that's enough or 12 or whatever the number is? And I'm like, nah, I think we're good here. I think we're good. You know? And, and so that less is more often, I, I would say pertail or pertains to a lot of these type a athletes, but with, without getting kind of far down the road here, Matthew, I'm going to turn to you. And kind of ask you these this the same four questions about one of your athletes, and you can choose the athlete that rode across the U.S. or you can choose some someone different. But the first question is, what were some of the things that you and your athlete did well to prepare for that big race or that big event that they were gunning for in twenty twenty two? I guess just starting with the the ride across the U.S. Um, you know, he was working a, a full-time um, three- or four-day block, um, 
each week it was either Monday through Wednesday or Tuesday through Thursday. And it, so it was helpful to have sort of a, a very, as opposed to a lot of, um, you know, other medical uh, schedules where it's the days are all over the place. It was helpful to have a pretty set schedule. And so we knew more or less what we were working with. Like we weren't going to ride these days. We were going to do something else and, here's what we're working with and here's what we can do. So I think we managed the, the time that he was available pretty well. Um, you know, it's tricky. Uh, like Darcy said, you, the propensity as a coach, or maybe it's more as, as a, an athlete inside of ourselves. Um, I don't know, you know, I'm always wanting to do more. You know, it never feels like enough, um, and I and I, it's easy to let that trickle into the coaching side of things. Um, so w knowing when to say enough is enough, and balancing, um, you know, how much they're working with how much they need to see their wife, uh, you know, just that whole the whole cycle of everything that we're involved in and uh, what your priorities are. Um, that's that's a hard thing to do, and I think I think we managed that pretty well for him. Um, yeah. and, and, and had a, had a pretty good run. Um, you know, he also, he lives in Colorado. So, uh, the winter he loves to ski. So there's not a ton going on in the winter. He's doing a lot on the skis. So, you know, you don't maybe have quite as good of a, a fitness start coming out of winter, which, you know, when you're going to ride across the U S might actually not be a bad thing. Um, right. so you kind of are just ramping up through things and, um, and just generally building a lot of fitness going into that. So I think, yeah, uh, managing the amount of time he had and, and maximizing that, um, I think we did pretty well. So if you did that well, what, what's something that you didn't do so well? Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of his fitness progression, I think we did pretty well, uh, things that we, um, you know, it's a lot more than just fitness. You know, what are we talking about with nutrition or, um, how to, um, fight through adversity. If you got a horrible saddle sore on day 12, uh, things like that. You know, I don't think we talked about that stuff too much. And, and also I think just due to, um, some time constraints and, and things like that, I, you know, maybe I could have pushed a little harder to get a few longer rides out to test some of that stuff, but, mm -hmm. um, whether it was lucky or not, you know, I think that stuff didn't come back to bite him. So, um, thankfully just with, uh, his good level of preparation and then a lot of good support, I think that kept him, uh, kept him, you know, on the right track and successful. Yeah. What are, what are the top one or two things that you learned coaching this athlete through that process and just gaining that experience kind of through, through him? Through, through this process, you know, this was the first time I had, well, I guess I coached some athletes who I did race across America, but that's kind of a different, little a different, different yeah. animal. Yeah. Um, so this was the first time I think I had somebody do something this extreme. I mean, you've, I, we've, Ride at this point, riding something like BWR or Steamboat or all those, you know, those, those used to feel like the extreme events and now they seem like the everyday event. But, um, you know, so uh, an event to this caliber, um, you know, just more or less picking up the experience of, uh, you know, what could you do differently? Um, you know, Leadville would be a great example for, for you, Adam. I mean, you've, you've coached it so many times and you know, all the ins and outs and secrets of like, what are the little tips and tricks? And so I think I learned a few things just from this one and, and from others in general, just, you know, what could you talk about differently on the front end? What could you sort of, you know, training is, a, is the time to do testing and things like that to, um, you know, see what nutrition strategies might work better for a long day on the bike or things like that. But, you know, ultimately this one was more, let's survive it. It's not like how fast could you do it? Not could anything like that. So certainly I, I encouraged him to start conservatively, um, and, you know, just, just kind of make it through. And by the time his CTL climbed to whatever 200 and, and, 
you know, at that point I was like, well, he's, you know, he's, he'll be just fine. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And just to frame this up before I get into the the fourth question here, but to frame it up, I mean, how long of days was this guy doing? And you said it was for like 40 days, right? I pulled it up here. So, um, I mean, on the run in, it wasn't until about, this is the end of April that we were starting to get um, some, some bigger weeks. Um, and from there, we were pretty consistently over over 11 or 12 hours. Um, but then when he started, uh, I think this is his first week, like 23 hours, uh, 30, 30 hours, 44 hours, 34 hours, 30 week, hours. Once he was into the event. Yeah. 40 hours. Yeah. Those are big weeks. 20, yeah. 26 hours. So, I mean, you yeah. can't, you can't really train for that on your own. Uh, no. unless you just do nothing else. So, um, yeah. yeah. And I think we did, I think, you know, April, May did a, did a pretty good job, you know, preparing. And then actually there was a little bit of a lull kind of in July, August. Uh, and I think that maybe actually probably served him well, just, in fact, I think he got COVID now that I remember. Um, and I think that actually probably served him kind of well, you know, it's kind of one of those blessings in disguise, like an athlete. Uh, how many times have we seen it where somebody breaks collarbone and then they come back and they wear the yellow jersey or something like that? Right. So, right, right, right. you know, something of that nature. So. so, so going through that process and kind of reflecting on it, you, you know, uh, as you have over the past month or so and reflecting on it now, knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently with this athlete? And, and that the answer could be nothing. Probably in this case, there might be nothing because COVID probably and his interruption made us pivot. Um, from the original plan. Uh, and I think we were pretty conservative about bringing them back uh, and, oh. and whatnot. So we just sort of like, we had ramped up and then COVID smashed it. And then we sort of just had to kind of ramp back in. Uh, so I, I think in this case, it'd be nothing. But um, yeah, so maybe not a great example there. Um, but I've got other athletes oh. that we learned this year, uh, some, some things uh, from, the, you know, on a less extreme scale. So um, just in terms of how much rest that they might need and bouncing between, for example, triple bypass mm -hmm. and, and intelligentsia cup and things like that. So athletes doing all sorts of crazy things. So, yeah. And I've had, I've had athletes like that, that do something huge and you kind of get lucky with like an illness or an, I mean, I hate to say that, but you get lucky with an illness or injury or whatever that makes them stop. And then they're flying, you know, kind of toward the end of the year. So I think what I've mm -hmm. learned, like from those athletes is like plan in, plan in the breaks and make them take it more frequently. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right. uh, you know, a week or two, you know, off the bike, um, two or three times a, a year after something huge like that, because it does help to, to hit the reset. And I think it's always more fun when you're resting healthy versus resting with a broken bone or something like along the same lines as Darcy's less is more. I think there's, yeah, it's just that propensity to do too much. Uh, agreed. Agreed. So, you know, it, it was super fun to walk through that process with, with you both. I mean, I, I, I learn every time I'm talking to fellow coaches and, and this is, this is really, this is really cool, in my opinion, in a very nerdy way. Um, but to our listeners, it, you know, what you just heard are, are four simple questions that I asked each of the coaches. And specifically, I, I call it the four what's. This is essentially a framework that I use with my athletes when we're reflecting on a, a big race um, or like a big week in training sometimes. Um, but it, it's, it's very effective when you're, um, you know, reflecting on 2022 and you're, you're trying to learn what worked, what didn't keep, what works, change, what didn't and move forward more intelligently rather than just move forward. Right. And that's really what I want our listeners to, to grasp, um, and in, into these like four questions. So to have a little fun too, cause we still have some time, Darcy. Um, <laughs> if you guys are up for it, I'm going to go through those four same questions and it's going to pertain a little bit more to like your coaching practice. Okay. 
And that it's going to be reflective exercise for kind of all three of us. And, and don't worry, there's no one else in the room. It's just us, you know, and the listener. Um, <laughs> but, but it's, no it's, I think it's super fun. Yeah. No pressure, Matthew. And if you need a pass, you can always pass, but you can also just go for it. Um, and I don't know what we'll get, but let's see. And Darcy, again, we'll, we'll start with you. You ready? Fire away. So as a coach, what's one area that you dove deeper into than any other this year. And that could be like, it could be self-imposed or like life imposed it upon you for whatever reason. Um, so tell us what that topic was and why. Gosh, there's two. And I'm trying to decide between the two. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go with the latter. Uh, I have been writing more consistently for our blog and then for ultra running magazine. Um, it's really fun to reach a broader audience with the stroke of a pen or typewriter, computer, whatever it is. It's been pretty free form. So I've been able to choose topics most of the time, um, and speak to the audience, be it beginner, master athletes, um, females going through menopause, um, and, and kind of dive in deeply and at the same time, refine my writing and again, reach that broad audience. So um, that's been something that is both challenging and super exciting to me. Like if you've written, you know, mm -hmm. you, you hit those like creative <clears throat> writing blocks and nothing's really coming and it's not that fun to like write in that setting and then you'll shift and then there's this flow and this sort of cascading of ideas. And I just like, you can't wait to get to my computer and talk to that audience. And, and share yeah, with them it's like super flowy. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's yeah. almost like a high of sorts where you just, you know, you get right. to be creative and you, and you get to help, uh, more than just that one particular athlete that you're training for a particular event. So, um, yeah. that's, that's the thing that's been an opportunity for me. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So what, like kind of on a, like, quicker because you kind of answered this already but what did you do well in that process like how did it like go well for you what, what are you doing to practice that and, and kind of find that flow uh con concise i've been uh trying to be concise and pointed with my words not using more words than necessary to make the point that i'm trying to make what didn't go so well for you this year while you're doing that process you know, like when you get into that writer's block and you force things, there were a couple, <laughs> this is just like my thing. Uh, a few times where I noticed I did not edit my work really well and mistakes did not get edited <laughs> out. And I think one particular example is like second sentence, uh, obvious grammatical error. And yeah. it just like grates on me. Um, so and attention to detail and that can like seep into other areas of coaching, right? Like attention to detail really matters in our, um, in our profession. And it's kind of obvious when you miss that attention to detail, you're, you're letting your athletes down, you're letting yourself down. Yep. So what are, what are the top one or two things that you learned going through that process of going deeper into creating content from the past year? Uh, being consistent, and this also bleeds into general coaching and fitness, right? Like if you're consistently practicing yeah. your craft, you're going to become a better writer. You're going 100%. to reach more people. Mm -hmm. And if you are the athlete that's consistently out there moving your body, you're going to set yourself up for success. Um, are you logging 15-hour yeah. weeks every week? Probably not, um, and nor should you be. But if you're really loving the process and you're getting out there and you're, or you're making it part of your lifestyle and being consistent and intentional with what you're doing, you're probably going to make progress. So if you choose to keep on pumping out the content into 2023, what are you going to do differently? I'll admit I'm not a goal oriented person, right? Like the word goal is one of my least favorite words. I can use objective, <laughs> uh, goal. Let's see. What am I going to do differently? I'm really not either for, for the record, Darcy, if that makes you feel better. Like it's, Whoa, yeah. I would have yeah, not I mean, they were probably that, like shocked. Yeah. A lot of people, 
a lot of people th think that I've got like this list and I, right here with all my goals from for the next 10 years. I'm, I'm not. Um, so I think that makes three of us. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's, I have a lot of, a lot of secrets, a lot of secrets that blow people's minds. That's one of them. I'm right there. <laughs> Okay. Well, that can be another podcast um, later, but for right now, Darcy, um, if you're not, even if you're not a goal, and this is, I'd argue that you could even say, oh, I'm not going to do anything differently other than what you said before, where it's like, um, just create that content and, and kind of fo go into that process, right? Because that actually makes better content, right? Yep. Yep. So kind of like keep practicing. Give but, myself uh, grace. Yeah, exactly. Like, sit down, write down totally. thoughts when they come. Uh, more often than not, my best ideas come when I'm out running or writing, whatever, right? Those endorphins are kicking in. I've made mm. myself stop, jot down that idea for an article on my phone and then come back to mm. it, you know, however many days later versus like, oh, I'll remember. I'll remember what I was thinking about when I was out running three days ago. I don't, my memory is very faulty. So it's that is like when ideas occur to me, jot that idea down really quickly. I had an athlete once tell me that he, he can solve all the world's problems twice over on a four hour ride. But by the time he gets home, <laughs> the world, the world has gone to shit again. <laughs> so it's the same thing. Yeah. Fact. Um, well, that's super cool. Darcy. That's, um, yeah, it's fun to hear you say that. And I know too, it's like, just like knowing that you've been pumping out this content, you know, on that backside, you can kind of like hear, you can hear your voice. Well, when you read it, right. Like at least I can. And, um, so it's, it's, it's rich to hear that kind of from you in that process. Uh, Matthew, I'm going to turn to you now. Uh, what, so kind of the first topical thing is like, What's one area where you dove deeper? And, and again, this could be self-imposed or was just imposed on you because of the uh, nature of the job or whatever. Uh, what did you go deeper in? On just the, I guess, sort of the uh, forefront's not the word, but in, in the beginning stages of this um, was wanting to serve my female athletes better um, by understanding uh, more about hormone cycles and all that stuff. And, and, uh, uh, I just started to sort of look into some of that stuff and bought Stacy Sims book. Um, and unfortunately it's still sitting unopened because I have three kids. Um, so that's something that I did not do well, it's a, it's a great um, book. but I it's a great book. but I'm, that's on my, on my to-do list. And I, I mean, to the, I guess kind of, maybe I'm getting ahead of you here, but on the on the good side of things you know i spoke with one of my athletes about it uh and we are trying to sort of work together to test things out and uh she's at a different point in her sort of athletic endeavors she sort of transitioned out of racing super competitively to more following the gravel events and the grand fondos and then buying houses out in the country that she needs to renovate and job getting crazy. So then training and life goals took an entirely different um, twist. So, you know, sort of exploring how we do all of those things with all the other things going on in women's lives um, that us men don't have to deal with. We're trying to sort of experiment with some of that stuff and figure out what, uh, what we can do better. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. I mean, so, you know, what did you do? Well, I mean, you started a conversation, right? You started a conversation that would help your athlete, uh, improve her performance by talking about her monthly cycle and how it pertains to energy availability, motivation, body feel on the day, that kind of stuff. Um, and in terms of maybe what you didn't do so well, probably it just maybe not, I don't know, you could say not have that conversation sooner. Right is kind of what I right. deduced from the conversation there. So as you're kind of in that process now, what, what's like the top one or two things that, you know, you like learn from that process just in terms of this topic in general or walking through that process? What are the top two things? I mean, I got to get deeper into the topic. I mean, that's, that's number one, uh, that yeah. needs to happen. But, but with, as far as what we're doing right now, um, 
you learn you need to read Stacy's book. That's what you learned. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. Well, and then I need 25 (laughs) hours in the day. Um, but, uh, I mean, we, so it wasn't until I guess just like this last week or two that we finally have set a, I guess, sort of test in place. She was traveling for work and just like, it was total chaos. So now she's home. Um, and we are putting a test in place as far as timing, training intensities versus cycle timing, uh, some stuff like that. And, and, uh, it's, it's a very convoluted process because we're also experimenting with some, some strength training and things like that. So we got a lot of different sticks in the fire, but we're, we're experimenting. We're going to see if we find something out uh, for her specifically and take some notes and see if we might be able to apply it to uh, some other athletes. Yeah. So the, you know, that final question is, you know, what would you do differently knowing what you know now? And I mean, kind of, kind of sounds like you're in the throes of that where you're right. trying new things, you're trying to experiment and, and really communicate a little differently. So that's awesome. And, and, you know, I think that is, you know, that's, that's the essence of coaching, right. Of simply reflecting on, you know, what worked, what didn't keeping, what did change, what didn't and kind of challenging yourself to, um, do it better next time. Right. And that next time could be a new year. It could be the next race. It could be the next month of, of coaching. So again, this, this process we're talking about, it's evergreen. Like it just, it continually flows. And that's, what's so cool about, I think what we all do as coaches, you know, we, we really get to, um, plan, experiment, test, and do it all over. Um, so that said, again, these four what's that, that, that's the framework that I'm trying to give to, uh, our listeners here as they're planning their, their, their next year and their annual plans and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I've got two final questions for you. We're going to get away from that framework. Um, but it's still a reflective thing. So Darcy throwing the ball back to you. What is the biggest coaching lesson that you learned this year? And it could even be like all time that you daily use in your coaching practice. So in other words, what's like the one thing that stands out to you that, you know, you learned 20 years ago when you first started at CTS or you learned last year, that's like, man, I do that all the time now. Communication. Like in the absence of communication, there's no coaching. And it's a two-way street. What your athlete says to you yeah. insists that you're getting yeah. communication from them. Communicate to them the theory, the intention behind what you're doing listen to what they're saying. So like Matthew, when you're talking about this athlete and um, trying to integrate her cycle into that, like kudos to you. Like I celebrate that so much Mm -hmm. that hinges on communication, right? Tracking. You have to measure in order to know how to adapt. Um, So whatever, whatever that looks like, text messages, emails, uploading files, tracking your menstrual cycle like it's all the platform is communication i would say there's arguably nothing more important well matthew it's pretty hard to follow up that answer but i'll uh throw the pitch the ball over to you and say what's the biggest uh coaching lesson that you learned this past year or in your coaching career thus far that you use daily well, Darcy, nice home run. Um, uh, I will grand slam. I, will actually. I, I would call that a grand slam. <laughs> well, I was going for the grand slam, but all right, that's fine. So she, so she hit the grand slam. Let's see if I can hit a single here, um, or even a bunt. Um, Go for yeah, at least a I mean, the the idea of you know what's the latest and greatest training idea, technology, all this stuff. It it can be very distracting and uh, just remembering fundamentals and basics and how far they can carry you, um, whether that's the fundamentals of, of training how to do it, you know, energy systems or whatever, what have you, or fundamentals of just being consistent and doing three right things, eat better, sleep better, and train consistently, right? Um, so just very fundamental, basic things and not, not getting lost in this minutia of, of everything that's being broadcast through social media and in our face all the time. You know, I might give you the, 
Lionel Messi, uh, like goal, extra golden point boot? kick in right there. Goal, the golden yes. boot. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. I, I know very little about soccer, but you know it, what he did was the basics of just like kicking it into the net, man, at the very end. And uh, people are going to hear this and be like, "Man, AP knows nothing about soccer." And it's true, but he kept to the fundamentals. <laughs> he kept to the basics. He won a World Cup. So there you go. Yes. Um, yes. The final question is, for everybody listening here who's focused on performance, self-improvement, what do they need to know right now listening as they're just like jazzed up about New Year, they're jazzed up about the seven races that you just signed up for? Circle the wagons. Find your community. Uh, yeah. Contribute to it and pull from it. You know, it, it, just one person alone. Uh, there would be no races, right? You need the race director. You need the volunteers. Um, you need the whole structure and contribute back, you know, um, give back. Give, it's just a give and take um, and, and identify what and who that looks like for you and really create it and contribute to it. I like that. Matthew, um, how about for yourself? Like for everybody listening here, they, they tuned in because they want to do – you know, a, a better new year, make a better self, a better athlete. What do you think they need to hear right now before they turn the corner here? You know, taking that motivation um, and just finding ways to channel it, maybe not necessarily on the bike uh, is a, you know, what can we do to better ourselves yeah. so that when we go to the bike or go to running or whatever that case you know, whatever that sport may be, um, preparing ourselves to uh, be ready to conquer the world when we're when we need to. But it's possible you have an event in March and April, and you got to be going. And you got to start start going. But um, you know, there's a lot of things that it's a you know it's a long a long year. And how are we going to get there? How are we going to be as resilient and bulletproof as possible to get all the way to uh, September October again? Um, still in one piece. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I mean, fitness can make us better people if we do it intentionally, right? And, and through that process, and I think that um, kind of the reflective process of, again, what worked, what didn't, keep what worked, change what didn't, challenge yourself to new heights, it's really what we're talking about here. And that process, I think, you know, can pertain really to anything, you know, from coaching to building an athlete to uh, becoming a, the best, I don't know, Jenga champion of the world, whatever it is, becoming the best husband, whatever you want. So you can really apply it to literally anything. And, but in the context of what we're doing here, I hope that it helps, you know, our listeners go better into 2023 by simply pausing, reflecting a little bit more and asking themselves some of those harder questions to come up with answers. So, um, it was super awesome to to have you both on like and in this format was was super fun i'm glad you guys played along and i'm glad you guys uh uh carved out the time we're actually going a little bit over so we'll wrap this thing up now but if if people man if our listeners fell in love with you matthew and darcy i mean are you guys on social media can they follow you there and are you taking on athletes i have room for a couple of athletes i have a pretty uh full load right now which <laughs> is uh is a good place to be um but yeah like the new year always brings like new excitement new athletes um and i i have room for for a couple uh i'm not super active professionally on social media um i think adam will put my my instagram handle in the notes um my uh train right email is the best place to reach me and i'm i'm on the blog there quite frequently so you can read my writings there and then on ultra running mag um i contribute there as well sweet yeah i'll post all that in our show notes so people can find it there as well uh matthew how about you um are you taking athletes where do we find you on the socials or out in the, out in the woods or something of our <laughs> yeah uh when i'm not uh uh distilling moonshine um <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm out, uh, there's, there's Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I'm on there a little bit, Instagram once in a while, um, yeah. come ebbs and flows, you know, but, uh, mostly, um, probably through, 
you know, through, through our train ride stuff, um, yep. is, is the easiest way. And, um, always, always willing and open to talk to people and, um, you know, discuss if it would be a good fit and what works. Yeah, exactly. And, and to our listeners as well, I mean, you, the quickest way to find these two and any, any other coaches is trainride.com click on coaches and then there's all of our beautiful faces right there. You click on, you can learn more about us. Um, if that, if that pertains to you. So, uh, that said, uh, thank you guys again. This has been super fun. Uh, Matthew, I'll let you get back to the, the craziness of kids and in-laws and all the moonshine making moonshine. I know that's your other side hustle. Uh, Darcy, mm-hmm. I hope you find some Zen in, uh, creating content more this week and, and get out there on a nice long run. Thanks so much, Adam. It was a, it was a great platform. I appreciate the time. Yes. Thank you. It was really fun.